Alrighty, here we go. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to a 10 a.m. panel, which you know, always a great time. Always a great time, yeah. So, <laughs> but we appreciate y'all immensely for coming out today. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you're gonna, hopefully you're gonna have some fun. We're gonna talk a little bit about, um, well, fighting game music. What makes it so cool? What makes it so hype? What makes it so fun? What makes it so blood pumping? What makes it great, yeah. Cause you know, it's a Magfest melee. And it's a perfect time to do that. So yeah, um, so we did this panel before, we did it for VGM Together, we performed it in MAG last year, uh, but this time we spiced it up a bit, we got some new people, some new noteworthy guests, like um, Lythero, a streamed streamer, uh, as well as Turn Down for Walt, uh, David B. Kimball, and Gecko Squirrel, if any of you... Wait, you should probably introduce like the what it was in the first place. The panel in the first place was a... Uh, little thing we made talking about fighting game music at VGM Together, which was like an online MAGFest surrogate, where we basically did some research into fighting game music and what makes it good, along with doing interviews with some community members from the fighting game community, or the FGC as we'll be calling it today, and uh, talking with musicians, talking with players, talking with content creators, etc., etc., and just overall seeing their very uh, different opinions on uh, how music affects fighting games. And uh, each year that we've rerun this panel, we've added new guests and stuff. And as Noah was mentioning, today we got a couple extra fun clips to share with you, and I hope you're excited for it. Yeah. So before we keep going on with uh, the music itself, we should probably study the matchup. So where are your opponents? <laughs> uh, so first off, start with me. So I'm Noah of NC Symphonies. I'm an in, I'm a, a musician. I'm a independent uh, video game music composer. I've written my own songs for albums, I've uh, worked on songs for other people, uh, and I'm generally, you know, I'm, I'm just open to any all collaboration, and, well not collaboration, uh, just writing for people. I've ran a Smash team in college, uh, I have stuck aside some of my favorite fighting games including Smash Ultimate, Melee, as well as dabbling into games like DBFZ, uh, BB Tag, and most recently Guilty Gear Strive. Um, as a filthy May main. Um, filthy main. Tosugeki. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> I had to. Okay, but yeah, uh, so that's a bit about me. Who the hell are you? Oh, hello. Hi, I'm the other guy. I'm DS Music, and I'm a VG, mostly a VGM musician working on doing remixes of video game music since about 2015. Most people would know me for piano covers and stuff, but I also do remixes and arrangements of stuff along with some producing and audio engineering. And along on the side, I also enjoy being a fighting game player. Where this guy started me off with Smash Melee back in the day, but you're welcome. In the last few years, I've been getting pretty heavily into more like 2D and like anime-based fighters, which is uh, one of the reasons. Today's prop is this frick is the fight stick I made a couple of years ago. Got a nice, uh, you know, Susano from Blaze Blue, my uh, esteemed fellow. Really good stuff. Really fun. Turn this genre has turned me into a bloody degenerate, but it's a lot of fun because I'm always very excited to see the new techniques and all the various ways that composers of fighting games make some of the best tracks in the video game industry. All right. And along with that, uh, I graduated uh, with a degree in mechanical engineering. But you know, that's, a, that's just a All right. that's petty talk. All right. Nothing big. You know the matchup. Let's get, into the, let's get into neutral. So, what makes fighting games so good? What makes fighting game OSTs so good? Now, easy question, you know, very, it's very simple. A very loaded question, too. Um, but yeah, uh, so we're going to be asking that central question throughout the entire game. It could be fast-paced, it could be energetic, but there's definitely a little bit more nuance to that, to keep all that hype going. Uh, oh yeah, um, just a heads up. I, 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 I'm not sure if we want to do that this early in the morning. But oh no, listen, I think they're all sleeping off their hangover still. I think they're up for it. So, <laughs> so every time we say the word hype in this panel, take a shot. Yeah, you'll uh, be see you in the hospital in like 30 minutes. It'll be a very interesting roller coaster ride. But yeah, basically, what we've tried to like encapsulate through this panel is using research and interviews to sort of see how fighting games and their OSTs have evolved through generations of players, looking specifically at two different facets, which are our main like thesis points, which are, are the fans drawn toward the music, or does the music evolve with the fans? Or is music more intrinsically good to the game and like uh, 
game design, game development, music production sense, or is the value of the community of the fans what hypes up fighting game tracks? And so we took a look at like both of those like pillars and uh, through our research and interviews and got like, a few interesting tidbits to glean out of it. And we'd like to start with the more like, human side of it. What, how did the culture of fighting game community influence game soundtracks? And uh, in order to get looking into that, we're going to have to take you for a little ride back to the good old days of the arcades, where <laughs> arcades were a melting pot of gaming, like the 70s and 90s, where many people could come together and enjoy fast-paced action, very high-octane uh, high games on arcade machines, which are one of the only sort of ways to, uh, which are one of the only sort of ways to experience games of that caliber with as much frames per second and as much graphics as they did back in the day as consoles weren't really developed to that standard. And it was, yeah, it was basically the best place to play due to better hardware and cabinets. And uh, in this sense, fighting games were initially developed with the sort of spectacle in mind and the sort of like, the free market thinking of we need to make something that's the most flashy, the most eye-grabbing, in order to appeal to the all the random people coming to the arcade. We need to make a machine with uh, sound effects and music to boot that will catch people's attention. And that's why, back in the days, for the classic fighting games, their OSTs were very loud and boisterous, utilizing lots of fast-paced and like tonally stacked pieces for like general, like always in-your-face action. And to and compete for your attention as well as your quarters. Exactly, and just looking to get, grab your quarters. And some fighting games even took this to further extremes and using the sound effects to complement this uh, attention grabbing method, which one very good example of that is the original Killer Instinct fighting game machine, which I don't know if any of you guys have watched the Fight On Killer Instinct documentary where some of the developers talk about their history of making the game. But in general, they, they made the sound effects and music in mind where when the cabinet would be brought into the arcade, the technicians would like calibrate the sounds and whatnot, make sure everything was at a certain volume level so that it was like consistent with the volume of everything else in the arcade. But what the developers didn't tell these technicians is that there's certain like hidden sound effects in the game that when they triggered, they were louder than the rest of the game. So of course, can you guess what sort of sound effects those were? Those were like, the you know, Combo breaker. Yeah, freaking the combo breaker sound, the ultra combo, all the more lively and action-packed scenes of the game so that when these, these, uh, these spectacle-building moments happened, they would be able to uh, really grab your attention and stand out more in your mind. So in this sort of sense, fighting game OSTs were more catered toward the spectacle of it all. But even then, once they grabbed these people's attention, what really made fighting games stand out from other arcade games at the time was the sort of environment that people immersed themselves in. Instead of going to an arcade machine and just playing, putting your quarter in, playing around and going as far as you can, you would instead be in a, put in like a 1v1 situation where you have to put yourself out there against another one and basically test your metal against this person. And it was this sort of competitive mindset that started the beginning of like the tournament scene and the fighting game community, started people pitting people against each other and forming friendships and forming this sort of community that would be developed on over time. Or forming an enemy if you're not careful. Yeah. Uh, so then we move on around the uh, turn of the century, later in the 90s. We start having consoles that can perform very similarly to arcade machines and we have a sort of new dynamic that is formed. We have things like the SNES and the PlayStation which are able to have ports of arcade machines, of arcade games put into them like Guilty Gear, like Mortal Kombat, like uh, Marvel vs. Capcom, etc, etc. And they also offered a lot better deal for the average player since you could, instead of having to go to a machine and put in a quarter again in one round, instead you can buy the console, buy the game, hook it up to your CRT and you have infinite matches, you have extra features such as training mode, you have uh, you have you can track Mr. Combos, you have yes. single player content, story modes, etc. And overall in general, this sort of new movement toward consoles allowed the fighting game community to further expand to like more peoples and more varieties of cultures because it allowed a more uh, personalized experience for an average gamer while also offering the same grassroots mentality as an arcade because instead of having to flock a bunch of people together to one arcade, you could, uh, anyone who wants to make a tournament can just take their consoles and their CRTs, head over to whoever's place they want to, and then get a tournament started. If they ever get the CRT there. <laughs> and so, it was this sort of growth of the community and people starting to grow up on this very accessible means of, 
of approaching fighting games that allowed people to start making connections between these, these, in, these interesting times and these fun times they've had as a kid with some of the, the moments and the details that have colored these, their experiences. So basically, while people wouldn't, while, when you're growing up and you're just playing Smash Bros, you're not specifically paying attention to analyzing the music, like, I like that song because it uses the modal mixture. No, you're not thinking about that at all. No, you're thinking about trying to just beat up your friends and having a good time with it and hearing Final Destination in the background in order to, like, beat the soundtrack to that good time. And so this is to have, this, uh, an unconscious connection between the uh, fun of the fight and the music, which just correlates in your, in your mind and forms that sort of click. And they have a quote here at the end, which uh, was a, there's a little excerpt from a panel I did two years ago on what makes music in general memorable. And it's really, memorable music is created from the intersections of emotions and personal culture developed over time. It's not just something that works, sometimes it's not just something that works because you have a special music thing, magic music thing that you put into the music to make people remember it. It's no. really, it's really a product of the times, a product of the person listening to it. And so we have a couple interviews that we'd like to show where people express that sort of emotion being built within them. The first one is uh, Dewey Newt, who's also a fellow video game music remixer, who works, he's done a couple like fighting game remixes and stuff, and this is what he had to say. As a kid, I think we had uh, one of the Street Fighter 2s, I don't remember. But we also had, I think we also had Alpha 2 on Super Nintendo. So that was like the first fighting game series I ever played was Street Fighter. But uh, I was bad, I was like four years old, and my brothers are all older than me. They just stomped me every time. Let me think, I really got into listening to VGM, probably started listening to specifically fighting game tracks at work. I want to say I started at Street Fighter just because I was familiar with it. A bit of it just comes from nostalgia, I'll say, like Melee, Melee soundtracks, just like, oh, menu one, it's like, what can you say about the menu theme? It's just, yeah. it is. You're a six-year-old and you hear all this crazy orchestral horns blaring and it gets yeah. you pumped up to be Pikachu and fight ice climbers. I guess a lot of mine's from nostalgia and then listening as an adult now. I have one other similar quote we had was from composer and uh, music artist Garrett Williamson, who it was an honor to talk to. He's a uh, we mostly talked to him because he was the uh, composer for the soundtrack to a uh, the Smash documentary metagame, as well as for Scott the Waz and for uh, PUBG, you No know, Straight Roads. He's been around the block. He knows what he's doing. And this is some of his experiences. If we're to go back to Melee, listening to that music, I've gotten used to it at this point, but if I really think about it, for sure that's one of those that I think there's elements where I'll hear stuff and it takes me right back to like that TV in my friend's corner back in like 2004, playing the game and having a good time and whatnot. But yeah, just to reiterate, nostalgia is definitely something that can be utilized very strongly to connect create a connection between experience and uh, attribute of a game such as the music and that was started what sort of started these connections within the uh, fighting game community's brain and so we cat fighting game developers start catching wind of their growing communities a growing competitive scene and also trying to cater to some newer audiences so they started experimenting with instead of just making osts purely for spectacle they started in interestingly making very spicy more unique and varied sort of tunes in order to further uh, capture what is, considered, what is considered hype music in different communities that played their games. So I just had a couple of examples that I want to show that showed like very, very uh, strikingly, contrastingly different tunes, but all sort of catching a different sort of as different facet of upbeat music. So first one I'd like to show is a classic from Street Fighter III Third Strike, which is considered one of the best Street Fighters of, a, of the early late 90s. And this Street Fighter more focused on having like a sort of grungy urban aesthetic, and so you can sort of see that through its use, this particular instrumentation. So like a lot of the game was focused on like an urban setting, very hip-hop vibe, and so you can see how some of the elements utilized in this track are like 
very, uh, very sampled grungy beats using the Amen break very fast and sporadically, along with having looping instrumental tracks such as like the flute track and the violin. Just utilizing the methods of sampling that was popular with the hip hop scene around the late 90s and sort of capturing that vibe within their, uh, within their fighting game. Another similar one would be, oh, similar but different, both in, similar in urban aesthetic, but with a very different sort of vibe to it, is the clock tower theme from Marvel vs. Capcom 2. What well, you see, instead of having that underground, like, dirty vibe, we have a more, like, lively, big band jazz, like, vaudeville sort of thing. You have instruments like piano, you have a rhythm section, you have brass hits, something, gen something similar but different, but capturing like a different vibe that was respected at the time. Shit. A little bit more subdued, a little bit more cold. But yeah, just a quick run through of some of the other examples. You can see how in Street Fighter EX Plus utilizes some more like sort of like late 90s like rom-com sitcom style closing credits music. <laughs> Whereas in Capcom vs. SNK2, they lean more into like the the club vibe and the EDM vibes of the time. You think... <laughs> oh, that's take a lot if you know the lyrics, you know? I mean, it's not hard. You got them right here on the screen. <laughs> Around but the world. You can see, like, very, like, heavy head bumping vibes, very heavily compressed, uh, heavily compressed drums that are very upfront, along with more sampling. And surprisingly a little bit more sultry. It's, like, flirtatious almost. Which is just fitting. And also, I hope the Mac staff doesn't get the wrong idea. <laughs> but yeah, you can see how the different, even, uh, even in the same era of fighting games, there were a lot of different genres catered to in order to connect with each sort of vibe of fans that was uh, trying out these games. Who's that gentleman staring us down? Oh yeah, that guy, right. Uh, so, this is another interview that we did, which unfortunately we don't have the, inter the audio for anymore because it unfortunately got corrupted, but this is a camera from the consoles, which the consoles is a Sydney-based jazz group that make like jazz fusion, like sort of classic jazz combo remixes of fighting game tunes and other video game music who are very great people. And Gamera basically, when we interviewed Gamera, he told us about during his stay in Japan, he went to the arcade scene there and he was blown away by trying out like the third strike cabinets and seeing like the variety of sounds that was opened up to him through hearing this uh, very different, unique t uh, approach to a Street Fighter soundtrack compared to like what had come before in Street Fighter 2 and whatnot. And sort of opened his eyes to like the sort of different vibes that you can get from fighting games. And so I would be remiss not to talk about developers catering to different musical communities without talking about the creator of the Guilty Gear franchise, Daisuke Ishitari, who honestly is a man I'd like to be one day. He, like, he, he's a guy, he basically, <laughs> he was a metalhead at heart. He like loved metal music. He sang it, played it, performed it, had a band. And so what he basically said in the late 90s was like, I want to make a metal album, but then I want to attach a fighting game to it. He did it before Toby Fox did it. <laughs> So basically, he, he wrote this album and then he made a bunch of fighting game characters based on like different metal references, different like music references. Like the, the big one is the main protagonist of the series, Soul Bad Guy, which is a reference to the Freddie Mercury song, Mr. Bad Guy. So, you know, cool stuff. Plus, Daisuke Ishitari himself voiced a Soul Bad Guy. And it, it all came together to make one of the biggest fighting game, anime fighting game franchises of all time since Guilty Gear Strive recently came out and popped into some sort of mainstream attention. And it all came about just because one guy really wanted to like share his interest with like the metal community through his work on the soundtrack for a fighting game. And so then we come a bit later to like the mid 2000s around like when the so-called slump of fighting games was happening. This was when more cinematic AAA video game experiences were coming out. You had like Call of Duty, Halo, Half-Life, things that shown into public attention as what really video game media could sort of be. And with the rise of mainstream video games, fighting games themselves became a bit more niche due to the fact they have like a high skill floor is not something that anyone can just pick up and play. And it's not really like an immersive experience, you know, like cinematic wise, like a normal video game. It's something where you have to just 
put in your own time to just grind away at and just try to get better with you. It's a very different vibe to what video games were at the time. So it was a bit harder to connect with the general audience. So instead of trying out new fighting games at arcades, it became the fighting game community's responsibility in of itself around this time to get new players to pick up these games, which was especially hard with the slump of the early 2000s. And uh, we have a quote that sort of encapsulates this from another person we interviewed who named Dr. Blue. He's also a fighting game YouTuber. He's done Guilty Gear Strive, Dragon Ball, got started with Dragon Ball Fighters, and he's also a music teacher and a drummer. And so he had this to say about like sort of inviting, trying to invite new people to the community during a hard time. We're still very, very small, and it's only recently that a lot of eyes have been turned on it. But if you think about it, people have been fighting like since the dawn of mankind. I feel like if we find a way to lower that skill floor, like you were saying, that uh, we're looking at the next boom in video gaming. Yeah, along with just trying to uh, find ways to get new people to join the fighting game community, another way that was used in order to entice new players was through sharing of the thrill and emotions of classic, iconic fighting game moments in the FGC, such as, uh, for some people who ever knows, the like Evil Moment 37, or aka the Daigo Parry, or the Wombo Combo. Basically, uh, isolated clips which it's very easy for any casual like video game fan to like get invested in because you have the spectacle of the game, you have the spectacle of the commentators that were hyping up what's happening, and then you have the background audio of like the crowd going wild and getting all crazy Aud over this. Audio? That's crackling. That's crackling static at that point. Yeah, basically. I mean, at that point, yeah. Uh, we're gonna have a segment for questions at the end of it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, and uh. When we talk with Garrett about some of his uh, perspectives with uh, some of his perspectives going into writing the metagame soundtrack, he referenced this sort of like energy in, of the fighting game community as part of what inspired him. I definitely composed most of the music based on... I, I, I had actually only ever gone to one major, which was uh, SmashCon 2015. The absolute hype from um, being at SmashCon and watching those guys play and the whole audience and everybody freaking out. I definitely heard certain music in my head when watching those matches and seeing the hype and the audience and everything. Just that entire, the energy of that, I totally heard a certain, maybe not like a, a distinct piece in my head, but I heard a certain sound. All right, so. Just to reiterate, around this time, it was getting a bit harder to entice new people to join the FGC, even with the sort of bounds of the community before. So developers started having to notice this change in dynamic, and they needed to make fighting games more than just an experience for two people to beat each other up. And they need to make an immersive and unique experience to cater to the larger, larger growing gaming market as a whole. So there's a few ways they went about this, which also, was, which also involved their music choices. One way they we went about it was just making fighting games more like a AAA title. And one a very, very prominent example of that is the uh, NetherRealm Studios and their work on the modern Mortal Kombat series. So uh, NetherRealm is known, has been known in, recently for making very good looking fighting games, especially with the release of Mortal Kombat 11 just a few years ago. It was heralded as like almost a AAA experience of having modern, breathtaking visuals, very realistic looking, very gritty along with having an in-depth story mode, lots of voice acting, lots of cinematic OSTs, and also very much a AAA game sort of experience. And I have an example really from the main it. theme of Mortal Kombat 11, which, which you'll notice has a significantly different vibe than some of the examples we've been playing before. Instead of having like in-your-face already right there, a, a attention grabbing action. Action, you have this very ominous, sort of grandiose cinematic buildup to it. You hear like the ostinato strings in the background, like the blaring brass, something you'd hear out of like an Inception movie or something, along with driving percussion. Like, something that you'd hear more in a movie or something, like in more modern AAA games would. And we had the privilege of being able to talk with the composer, or the main composer of the Mortal Kombat 11 soundtrack, Wilbert Rosé II, and he talked about some of his thought processes and ideals going into composing music for a fighting game that's also tailored to be a AAA experience. 
one of the advantages that fighting games have over any kind of action game necessarily, especially produced in like the Western modern style, is that fighting games always have this mimetic association between stages, the visuals, and the music for that stage. And so I think that taking advantage of that and really diving deep into like, okay, well, here's this stage, you know, let me write something that goes well with it. Mortal Kombat is kind of different in that it's always been about the sound design, I would argue. Especially once we get to the more cinematic MK games later on. Music is kind of much lower in the mix than pretty much any other fighting game is. But you know, it's, it's very refracted and you know, it has to go through this implementation system. It's dynamically mixed as well. So it's more about uh, texture than being like, here's this front and center, right in your face piece of music that you could easily hear in like a dance club or something. I think that the aesthetic now is that here is this world, here is this, um, you know, all of these characters, and music just simply emanates from the setting. It's trying for music not to feel like it's been placed on top of the score of the, of the film or the, or the media. But it should feel as though the music is just naturally emanating from it. Yeah, notice he's always said he sort of composed music more as a texture rather than an actual track. So one of the ways that fighting game developers would try to sort of cater to that new growing gaming community would be to create their soundtracks more with the vibe of, have, of elevating the game first and foremost in the, in the player's mind and then developing the side stuff like the sound design and the music around it. But that's not to say that all fighting game developers start doing this. There's definitely game developers that stuck more toward the classical traditional roots of fighting games even going into the 2010s. And so we have some examples of a uh, how they sort of went wild with their imaginations with uh, character themes. Because as more as tour time and go, went on, one of the major aspects that, that specifically affected music was the inclusion of more varied and unique rosters of characters and stages, which is embodied by the uh, iconic tagline from Smash Bros. Ultimate, everyone is here. With each new idea embodied by a character, new styles and genres of music could be written in order to express the personality of these fighters, which allowed for a much greater range of expansion into you know, very unique attention-grabbing genres in order to like sort of cater to each specific character. So uh, we have a million examples here, definitely not get enough time to, but I'd just like to highlight a few in particular which really stood out to me as being as a being noteworthy within some fighting game circles as being uh, iconic tracks. And especially for me, the one I really want to get to is... For us. But, yeah. Is uh, Must Die from Blaze Blue Central Fiction, which is the newest Blaze Blue game released in 2015. Included a variety of new characters, including Susano, who's not, once again, the guy that made... He, put on my he will find any excuse to flex this thing. <laughs> and, uh... Basically, a short, quick TLDR of uh, the character is that he's an ancient god of destruction who's one spirit but has several human incarnations, but only achieves his true form through a time-bending suit of armor. It's, 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 Blaze Blue is basically the Kingdom Hearts of, of fighting games, but it doesn't, that's another panel for another time. Okay. But basic TLDR, big unga bunga samurai god of destruction. And uh, his theme really does capture that vibe in certain unique ways. So as the song starts, note the use of like more traditional Japanese like samurai vibe with uh, the drum rhythm and the instrumentation, such as the kodom flute. And then pay attention to how it very quickly, uh, not devolves, but sort of ramps up. So you know it starts out neat enough. And then you quickly get into Daisuke Ishiwatari's classic headbanging metal sound, which, yes, the Blaze Blue soundtrack was also produced by Daisuke Ishiwatari. And so, of course, he puts in his thrill, he puts in his taste yeah, alongside it. Man's is everywhere. And then it's him singing, a nice visceral, guttural, standing sort of sound, very ominous, very chaotic. And eventually all this starts mingling along with the traditional instruments from early before to create this very unique sort of soundscape which um, gets the, the ritualistic chanting along with the driving percussion and rhythm guitars to, to really create that chaotic evil sound. 
And while this song is uh, lambasted a little bit in the Blazeville community for being, you know, a bit overly edgy, to the people that it really speaks to, like, it really gets that vibe, night, and which is why I especially like this song. And it's, I think it's a very great embodiment of the character, but also a great, just a great tune in general to be able to play a match to. It's, it's more. And so yeah, fighting game composers were masters of combining very unique genres in order to embody all these aspects of unique characters. I mean, I won't be able to get to each one in depth, but you can hear how even between a, a couple of characters, you can hear such a drastic uh, change, such as... Uh, uh, this is uh, Clarence theme from Rivals of Ether, which is a, like, a Smash Bros. style like platform fighter. It's Smash, but you can't grab the legs. And it's a very pixel-based fighter, but it's, it sort of describes like a... Also a time warrior goes back in time and try to save the future. Has more of like a heroic vibe to it. Then we come back to some more jazz stuff like we did with Clock Tower theme from with Unfinished Business with, from Skullgirls. Which instead of having that like big band vibe from the last song, we have a more like It's a jazz club is what it is. Yeah, jazz underground jazz club vibe. You just see cigarettes smoke through the air. There's like some poetry, bringing like some slam poetry on stage. Maybe a guy with bongos and a beret. But yeah, you can see how with a, the variety of new and unique characters that were being made in order to cater to more play styles, lots of new song styles are being written for as well. Which, speaking of catering to new players and new styles, that's basically what fighting game developers were trying to do. By incorporating more unique characters and play styles into their games, it offers more choices for new players coming in to find a character to express themselves as they search for a main. Like oftentimes I hear with new fighting game players that they picked up a fighting game because there was a character that they saw they liked and they tried him out and they had a really fun time with it so they wanted to just keep playing the game more. So another person we talked to who had a sort of, who shared his experiences with trying to find uh, with uh, experiencing the Black Blaze Blue series and finding a character in there was a fighting game friend of mine named Brule, who uh, I've known for ever since the first MacFest I've come here, and he's been a person I've played fighting games many times. So he has a lot of a he's a pretty deep knowledge of like the general anime fighting game community, and so he was with some of his experiences looking through characters in Blaze. There are times that there are characters that I saw that I wanted to try, and then I play it, and I didn't like it, but they found another character that I love in the roster. And then Jin was the first person I picked up, and he just didn't speak to me. Uh, and then I did Hazama. I think it's because Hazama was nothing I ever experienced in a character. He is so unique, and I think that's what made him so fun. The funny thing is, even though I love Guilty Gear's music, I think Blaze Blue, if we're talking about like central fiction, so of everything, mm -hmm. uh, is a better complete package. You mean like genre-wise, like more variety? Yeah, or of more, more, I like the music. I like way more songs in the, in the Blaze Blue uh, album than I do in Guilty Gear now. They're just so, all the, of almost every character's theme I, I like a lot. Makoto theme Alexandra is pretty good. Uh, the red hair girl before she changes to uh, Izayoi, I don't know her name, but her theme is really good. Zamas is obviously really good. Uh, Ragnos is good. Like Ragna versus Jin's theme is good. There's just like, there's just so many good songs. But yeah, just notice how he mentions like there's so many different unique vibes than even with all them. So all each song like speaks to a certain character, a unique play style, a unique story. And each of them caters to a certain kind of player, which uh, fighting game developers would try to sort of reach out to through you and new and unique characters. And I'd be remiss talking about a whole ton of different characters and bringing them all together through the soundtrack without talking about character select themes or the theme that plays when you're on the character select. And you have all these characters with all these different play styles, but then you have this one track in the background to sort of capture that vibe of all these different personalities and stories coming together. So, a person we talked to about that was one of our new panelists, or new interviewees for this panel, which is Gecko Squirrel. He's a, also a fighting game YouTuber, and plays a lot of Guilty Gear, and he uses a lot of fighting game music within his videos in order to sort of emphasize the points he's making. And so this is what he had to say about like incorporating character selects themes within his videos. The character selects from any French bread game, especially like Melty Blood uh, Actress Again Current Call, Obviously, I use them in videos quite a bit. They're able to set the scenes of like different stories and moments in videos really well. It feels like a good starting point for everything, which obviously, you know, it's the character select. So that is quite literally the start of 
the match, the first thing that you're going to see. And then re-encompassing that into different stories, so taking it where you're setting up and giving context to people works really well, and that's really nice. But yeah, I know we've just been bar to do this a million examples, a million different things, but hey, that's what the fighting game developers are doing too. They're trying to cater to more play styles and more character archetypes through both uh, gameplay and the music, and that helps further cement the connection between the player character along with the music and the player of the character who is enjoying that music for the theme. And so we have uh, this sort of catering to the community that's going on. It, an interesting point is brought up that while fighting games need to include lots of new things, lots of new characters, lots of new play styles, music, and etc., they also need to strike a balance between grabbing these new players while also appealing to the veteran fans who've been there since the beginning in order to retain that core audience and build upon that grassroots nostalgia that we established before You're gonna for this community that had been per firmly playing their games for several years. If you're gonna make a fighting game, you need to know where you've been. You need to know your fans. And so this is affected more than just in the gameplay, but it's also, the music is affected by this too. A couple of noteworthy examples being the uh, soundtrack for the 2013 reboot of Killer Instinct, which- Which we'll get to later. Which we should definitely get into later. Its main theme was composed or remixed by Mick Gordon, who, you know, you might have heard from doing like the Doom soundtracks and whatnot, but he brought his own passion and energy to a very heavy metal, very high energy remix of the original Mortal Kombat, uh, no, sorry, Killer Instinct theme from back in the day. Oh my god. And uh, one, uh, one very interesting example that we had for this panel was uh, the soundtrack to Super Smash Flash 2, which I admit, I don't know if some of y'all might have played that, Back in middle school, back in the day, played the original Super Smash Flash. It's basically like a Flash-based browser game with like a whole, it's basically Smash Ultimate, but in like pixel sprites before Smash Ultimate was a thing. Sandbag mains, Rise Up. Yeah, Sandbag was playable, you have Sora playable, etc., etc. Hey. <laughs> and uh, we actually got to talk with the main remixer and like the main director of remixes for Smash Flash 2, Turnabog, who's also a fellow video game uh, remixer. And he had some interesting thoughts to say about well, his thought process and ideals behind creating a remix of a tune for a Smash-based fighter. You will always have to more or less face the reaction of your fans when you release the music or when it plays in game. Uh, you will have some fans who want something that's exactly like the original and you will have some fans who will uh, welcome very well a lot of changes you can bring to an arrangement. What you can try to do in that case is, uh, like I said, uh, try to find a kind of middle ground, stay like close to the original so it fits uh, the universe, the game, the original music, and try to bring something original to uh, differentiate a little uh, the music you want to create. And say, yeah, we'll definitely have more things to say about like remixing tracks over time and how fighting game developers sort of implement new and old to create that yeah. middle ground. But it, yeah, Turnabout just has very interesting thoughts that will be reflected later on in the panel as well. So uh, yeah, before we move on to the next slide, probably another crucial thing that the that the fighting game community has to consider, or rather the developers have to consider, is making their music more readily available, making it open for anyone to use, sort of express with, which is why, as far back as the early 90s, Fighting Force and their developers were the first studio to release their fighting game soundtrack as a CD, truly marking a, a point where they can make it more readily available for anyone to use, sample later, analyze, it really engage with it. Uh, and this sort of evolves today into uh, video game music uh, covers, uh, sort of fan versions, and then using them on stream, which is a uh, whole other can of worms. Uh, very hit and miss. In fact, uh, a quick little thing. Uh, when we talked with Life Thero, uh, he, he and Walt actually just kind of went on and on about, uh, oh, we have a bunch of songs that we can't use, and there's even like a playlist of like big no-no songs, like no-no very bad, no money list, um, with the, and then the playlist of songs they can't use. Uh, but yeah, that's another ugly thing. <laughs> Thank you, Nintendo.
But yeah, I mean, that's also one way, another way that fighting game developers can cater to game communities, allowing their, is, uh, distributing their tracks for people to enjoy even outside of the fighting games. But yeah, let's get to the, let's sort of get to the wrap up and get to the meat of the uh, human side of this, uh, this panel. So, the cultural connection. The connection between music and FGC was built through the grassroots arcade communities of the past, and that laid a groundwork for, of nostalgia to build upon and work upon for future installments. That groundwork was evolved as new games were developed to please the evolving community of veteran FGC fans and new gamers alike in order to compete with modern, console competi modern game competition. So, through all that, people have been able to come to associate the hype and the fun they've had from playing fighting games with the music that colored these fights due to the efforts of developers and composers along with just the vibes of the community that they've been in with over time. We just have two examples to show of how music has been sort of embedded within the community and their experiences, first of which being from Gecko Squirrel, who was describing a time that uh, of a very interesting event that happened at uh, EVO itself. Oh, all right. I think it's EVO 2017. There's a match in top eight where one of the players is playing Nanase, and you can hear in the background, they put it to auto! And they go into the thing and the first few notes happen, and you just hear the crowd cheer, like really loudly. I like it. That, that's cute. That kind of stuff, I really like. And basically what I'm playing right now is Nanase's theme, which, and for those who don't know, saying they said it to auto just means whatever the first player one's character is, that player's character theme would play during the match. So this was the music playing during an EVO match, and everyone's going crazy because there was this, like, this fun anime hyperpop sort of sound being played on a serious fighting game final match. And it's just this sort of like contrast of emotions, but just a general uh, happy-go-lucky sort of music that really flavored this unique experience and built the community even more. This is so happy, I love it. And then uh, one more uh, sort of like emotional, more deeper, personal story we got was from Dr. Blue talking about how he developed a very intimate connection through music and how it's sort of like spoken to him even today. Specifically, I have one of a student, uh, and he came in one day, his name was Davis, and he was like, I want to learn Avenged Sevenfold. And from there, because I love Jimmy the Rip Sullivan from Sevenfold so much, we developed like a kinship. And so anytime I would get into something new, I would be like, hey, what do you hear? Can you feel the 30 second notes? Do you feel how it goes from duple to triple time? What do you think about the time signature? What's happening here? So anytime I would find something new with Dragon Ball Fighters or anything along that nature, I would bring it to him. Anytime I hear <laughs> fighting games, it just reminds me of uh, that era. But yeah, and so that's basically in a nutshell, being able to cater to a community through emotional and nostalgic attachment has been a very prominent source of connecting fighting game music with that sort of overall hype factor. But it's not, as I've said before, that's not the only thing that fighting game music can do in order to be that good. And that's why I want to start bringing it over to Noah here and start talking about the other aspect that we mentioned earlier today, which was the sort of intrinsic game development sort of properties and what music can do in order to be... Uh, I'll, I'll let him explain it. I thought you'd never ask. All right. So uh, now we're going to go into a little bit of how, you know, you have all these songs, all these great songs. But now, how do we bring it all together? How do we have a full soundtrack that sounds coherent and one that sounds great in context, not just in isolation? Because we can listen to these all we want, but you don't really experience it until you're in the midst of the fray. So I'm going to throw a big word at you. Don't be afraid. This is part of the matchup. Um, ludomusicology. Basically, the study of game, music, and sound, and how it relates to the experience. Uh, generally, it can help you feel immersed in the game. It can make you feel uh, like you're really about to get into the action. It can be snappy. It can be commanding. It can be everything you want it to be to sort of get your attention and make you want to go in the fray and kick some butt. So, oh, sorry, I, I have to censor this. I don't know if kids are watching. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it can build up to like the climax of the match. Uh, but we're gonna let our dear friend uh, Garrett Williamson once again chime in and explain. I know some people have argued that it's like, what is it like, 
fifty percent of the experience of a of a game is the audio. And he's kind of right because have you ever played a game? Have you ever played a match without the music? It feels eerie. It feels deafening. It almost feels like you don't want to be there. Um, sure, it can be snappy and commanding, uh, but you could also have something that's a little bit more subdued, something that's a little bit more relaxed. And that's where our dear friend Turn Down for Walt, a video essayist for the Melee community, also chimes in. I don't think it necessarily needs to be high energy, but I think it should, it should match the experience that the players want to get out of it. So, you know, again, like high energy isn't something that's uh, mandatory or required, but if you are super fast paced, balls to the wall, you know, nonstop action kind of thing, then yeah, you probably would expect to see something a little bit uh, higher on the tempo when it comes to music. So, yeah, so you can have something that's high up tempo. But one of my favorite examples, again, I, I, I have a heavy bias towards Smash, so bear with me. Um, so you could have something like the original Smash 64 select screen, where it's very minimalist, very bloop, 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 before it builds up to the character select screen, where there it's like, okay, now it feels like we're getting somewhere. Now it feels like we're prepping for something. Um, or you could just have what literally every game from Melee Onward does and just have the same song play throughout the whole thing to keep that energy up after such a bombastically large intro followed by silence of a title screen and then you go for it again. So, uh, you could have that or like the DBFC online lobby theme where it's also high energy and I think you can customize that music, right? No? Uh, no, not really. I, I haven't played it in a while. Uh, but yeah. I'm still waiting for rollback. Yeah. <laughs> soon. Coming soon. Yeah, we all are. Uh, so uh, now, is it working? There we go. So, um, so yeah, it has to have a strike balance. There's this very fine line it has to walk. Um, it's easy to get into that state of keeping the energy up, getting lost in the action. Um, and it can be used to push the action forward. It can be used to uh, set up some sort of action. Um, but then you also realize that it's not gonna be, like you might have that song looping for a while. You might be in a match that lasts like what, seven minutes at most, or like a couple minutes at best. So you need a song that's gonna be able to loop, a song that you'll be able to hear over and over if you're gonna play the same match over and over. And so that's where uh, Dr. Blue chimes in again um, with a pretty uh, informative quote. Like fighting game music is so brilliant because it's just going on in the background and you don't really notice it. You're just trying to land that combo. But then all of a sudden, it's in your head. You've heard it so many times. It's just like baked in there. And it will be baked in there. And uh, uh, conjointly, uh, Gamera, when we interviewed him, I'll never forget, he said, lock someone in a room and play the song like 50 times. And if it doesn't make them, if it hasn't driven them to insanity, it's a catchy song and they're not, if they're not sick of it. Uh, we're not condoning that. <laughs> we're not going to do that, we swear. Uh, all right, lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, thought you'd never ask. Um, so, okay, so uh, probably a great example of this, probably a little bit more of a case study kind of example, a, a very classic one. Uh, we're going to go over the evolution of each of these themes, probably the most iconic themes that Yokoshima Mora has blessed us with since uh, the dawn of the 90s. Uh, and so, because not only do you have to have like a character theme that will incentivize some sort of action, uh, but you need to have one that will match the character choice. Hold on. Screen is not seeing anything right now. Sorry, screen. Just so much. Sorry about that. Anyway, so uh, so yeah, so we're gonna have. So I'm gonna talk over while we uh, play these because I'm sure everyone's heard these like a million times. Um, but you have it's even for it being co sound compressed as it is, you can still hear that classical Japanese percussion playing in there with some sort of energy. Almost sounds like it's a bit defensive, almost like it's on guard, like it's ready for anything you want to throw at it. Um, I guess in a similar vein, you also have Ken's theme from the same game, uh, which kind of speaks a similar energy, but something with a little bit more snarkiness to it, I guess, which I guess is more fitting for Ken. Um, something that's a little bit, he's a bit more cocky about it, 
he knows that he's he knows he's ready. He knows he's good. He's he knows he's good. He knows he's ready to like kick to face off of you. Um, and now. And now, because you have such an iconic theme that's inseparable from the character, now you have to get to a point where you have to revamp it. So we're going to flash forward quite a bit to 2010, which uh, is the age where I think the Super Street Fighter soundtrack has probably reached its peak. Fight me. Um, it will, uh, but that's because like, it's at this point where we get to the 2010s, like an EDM kind of era. And that's when you need something that will keep like a heavy kick going, that driving energy but still something staying true to the original theme, which has, has like this very synth, very kick and bass heavy kind of sound uh, that will sort of ensure that no one's gonna get bored. Um, but still, you can still hear that the is still in the same key, everything's kind of kept intact. Now we get to Ken's, okay, I'm sorry. I love this song. This is like my favorite song in like the entire SSF4 soundtrack. And that's just because of this bass right here. I'm sorry, I, I just need to take a moment. I'm sorry, so anyway, but yeah, you can still hear that driving energy to it. Uh, <laughs> you can hear that driving energy, you can still hear, uh, you can still very so clearly hear it's Ken. I, through association, but also just something that sounds like it's like more hot, more of a stronger threat than you would have ever realized. Um, and so now we flash forward a little bit more to uh, to 2015, no 16, uh, for the SF5 soundtrack, uh, where we've got to a point where we've you know sort of had this high-end technology. We don't need to rely on like these limited melodies anymore. So we now have something that sounds a bit more cinematic. Gonna have something that's a bit more uh, high energy, but still high fidelity, and still through the reused roots. While you don't have as much Japanese percussion in your face, it's still that iconic Ryu theme, you know. Uh, and then they also just kind of added a little bit of flair to Ken's theme too by adding this little solo in the beginning, which also kind of meshes well with that rock sort of era that really em embodies kind of what Ken is, like this cocky American fighter who thinks he's, you know, he's like on top of the world most of the time, which I'm all for. Um, I guess more of a Western kind of attitude. It's more like a whole East and West thing. Uh, so yeah, so you have that kind of energy. But now we're gonna get to a case study, another a quick example uh, of a song that I'm sure uh, no one has gotten, like no one like, really thinks about it anymore because it's like so baked in everyone's collective memory. Um, so b before we uh, dab dabble into, we have uh, two quick appraisals, appraises from uh, two interviews from David Kimball, a content creator and probably the biggest Melee fan on the planet, uh, and Garrett Williamson again. Right. The, the co that, I, I like that you talk about the cohesion of the soundtrack, because that's, that's really something that Melee did so well. I mean, Final Destination's theme connects to, you know, the Smash 64 opening. Credits. You have Battlefield, which connects to the menu theme. And, but, but somehow, they all sound so distinct. And, and they, it, it's like, almost like you have to remind yourself that it's referential. You have to remind yourself that it's a motif from another song. Okay. So yeah, and then you have that, and then we have Garrett, who goes on to say. It's one of the most like hyped, like one of the most hyped uh, melodies that, that I can think of off the, like if somebody says like think of something that's really hype you know, one of the first things that I'm going to think of is that like menu music from Melee. Oh boy. No one's still playing that drinking game so I think we're good. <laughs> Alright. So uh, to go a little bit further into it um, we have, uh, I'm, I'm going to have it play it in the background a bit as I talk uh, so yeah I'm sure if you've picked up if you've ever been to any competitive scene, you've heard this song before. Um, don't be afraid, I'm not going to analyze that. It's, it's a bunch of music theory jargon I don't want to share and confuse too many people. Um, but basically, this song has this embodiment of semi-seriousness. You can tell that it's 
very forward, very aggressive, but not very aggressive, but like very serious. It's very much determined and driven, but still with like this little bit of coy playfulness that comes with the fact that you're using Kirby to pin up against uh, the ice climbers, or you're someone to like someone is uh, gritty and rushing as Captain Falcon against um, Ness. Uh, <coughs> but you have that, but you also have this embodied by these leaps. So like, you don't need to like be able to read music, but you see how it like jumps up on the staff like almost quickly. It's this very playful, very dynamic uh, sort of melody that can uh, take its time to like jump around a bit. Um, and besides, it only lasts 32 measures. It only lasts like about a minute, not even. Uh, so you have a song that will loop, ne not get necessarily get too tiring, or sound like it like abruptly stops anywhere. It just kind of loops. Um, and then we just have a uh, quick quotes from Dr. Blue again. There's a and Gary. Quick shorthand for writing pop. It's uh, repetition breeds catchiness. And that is just another great example of that. Uh, I I think what it, what it said and 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 I think what a good fighting anytime I've played a fighting game I I think w what it says is or at least the, the goal has been. Um, it's that attitude of, of um, I think what it's trying to do is give you almost the same feeling as if you were actually getting into like say a real wrestling match or something. You know what I mean? It's like one yeah. of those it's one of those deals where it's like, all right, we're gonna get you hyped up because you're gonna go in there and you're you're gonna kick some serious butt. But yeah, and that's that's just kind of something that's sort of like stuck with pretty much any competitive Smash player for the longest time, um, and it's almost kind of why it deserves to be in its own ranking. Uh, even though most people subconsciously don't even think about it when they play. Um, so now, not only do we, ha so yeah, you have all these sounds that will help uh, complement the, complement the game, but also a little something that forces you to engage with the sound in the soundtrack. And that's where we come back to Killer Instinct. Um, you have the dynamics in the background, raise the intensity. Uh, we're gonna have a quick example of Colin's theme, um, where this, something that's a little bit more mellow, almost, it's almost very tranquil, but then it hits you with this orchestral, this epic orchestral kind of sound, but not too orchestral, uh, as the drums start coming in to give a groove, like a sense of momentum. Uh, and, and not only does it have this sort of revamped kind of sound, uh, but it also has you, as most of you probably know, they have a section, oh wait, hold on, hold on, um, a section where you can use your ultra combo and make you I feel like the maestro. How good of a video game it was, and the dev team really did know what they were doing. And that's actually something that should be talked about, about the video game music, because Killer Instinct is like the best fighting game whenever it comes to fighting game music. That game literally played the music in time to your combo. And, just in case you have, oh wait, why is it muted? Uh, so we... Before you play, just context real quick. So, Killer Instinct 2013 was really a proponent of like dynamic music in a, what's the term for it, uh, when music just is implemented in a way where different player actions affect how the, tr the OST is being changed. And so one of the ways that was really prominent, prominent that lots of people remember fondly is the usage of, like, of differing music tracks during ultra combos, which is basically like a set series of inputs that happen that while, and while it's playing on the screen, the music adjusts to it where the different beats of the track sync up with the different hits of the actual combo. And so, to demonstrate it. <laughs> Probably the best example of implementing rhythm game ideologies in a fighting game. <laughs> and this just happens with like so many different mechanics throughout the game. It's not just this isolated bit, but it's in so many places that people remember it very fondly for. Yeah, uh, which kind of leads into uh, a little bit a uh, discussion of some nuance in the games, which is something that you kind of also crucially need. Um, so you have something that will sort of keep the game's tone going, 
uh, that's something that also kind of complements the visuals. Um, you have uh, you have something that could all stay together, but you could also have something that comedically clashes, like this song from Animal Crossing and Smash Ultimate soundtrack, which is really this whole hodgepodge kind of soundtrack anyway. But I d but it's such a stark contrast, especially when you have like Kazuya Mishima and Solid Snake on the same stage as this. It's just a very small, slow, emotional love ballad plays in the background. I, I, it, it, I've never felt more conflicting feelings in my entire life. Uh, so you have stuff like that, but then you also have emotional songs like, uh, like Stardust Memory or the Days of Eternity version from Blaze Blue Central Fiction, um, which I'll play the quick clip above right here. Just for context, this is a song that plays like during the credits of the uh, story mode, which, uh, Blaze, like I said, Blaze Blue Story Mode is a whole panel in and of itself. But like, this song is pretty iconic within the Blaze Blue community, just for like being an interesting, like emotional contrast to the rest of like the high paced, over the top action of the series. And it just calms down the story and fits with like the beats of the story mode and the sort of rather surprisingly emotional plot of it with a very tender sort of feel which lots of people have been able to connect to as far as a solo sad emotional ballad. Yeah. And it only gets heightened... Oh wait, oh my god. Uh, and Take it, your time. Oh my god. And it only gets heightened uh, with the credits version for the Days of Eternity where they add vocals. They add this sappy emotional piano. Which this is credits from the last game in the series, play, or maybe not credits, but it's inserted near the end of the story mode for the last game of the series. So this just makes it feel more like a culmination of all these wacky shenanigans, but one that all came together through the actions of you, the player. And it also just kind of speaks to Ragnar's story, really. I would just wish he could have like a normal childhood, but he had to spend it protecting. Yeah, so hold on. So yeah, so you have that kind of emotional slowness. Uh, they even add some drums later, just make it sound all the more rounded. Um, so now we've reached a point where um, we got to keep it quiet because now we have moments in fighting games where silence actually helps. It's like this moment of sonic whiplash where you have all this high stimulus coming into your head, you have a lot of sounds in your ears, a lot of fighting, uh, fighting moves, and there are sound effects coming in as well as the music, but you have these moments like the astral finishes in Blaze Blue, or like the Smash Ultimate like, kill screens, like that red screen where it flashes, and you have all these lightning effects, and it could mean, oh, you're about to like, be dead, or you might have a chance to get back in, but this could be the killing blow if you don't do anything about it. Um, or even the Guilty Gear Strive counter hit to an extent. Um, and counter. <laughs> and so you have the moments like that. Um, and it's this kind of, this intense feeling where it's like, um, it brings everything to a screeching halt um, before it goes back into the action to sort of add some more element of surprise rather than just the straight music straight through. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and then, that also just kind of begs the question, though, how much is too much? Uh, and so sometimes, you know, you may not necessarily want a song to be playing. It may not be the most advantageous to you. Maybe you don't work well with music. Um, it really varies from player to player. And we have people like uh, Kent Ward from uh, Ongaku uh, Overdrive uh, who commented on it as he's a pretty Maybe big fighting game most fan. Most of the time, I will listen to the in-game music, especially for the fighting games I play, because the soundtracks are all nice. They're all, they all do a great job of defining who the character is. Um, nowadays, music's made as part of the character's personality. So I think it's important when you're fighting, fighting that, like, you know, it goes along with the whole vibe of the, the, who the character is, their stage, their movesets, their persona. Uh, you know, their little mannerisms. I feel like, 
you know, it's part of the soundtrack. Like, if you're watching a movie, do you start just blasting Metallica while you're watching Star Wars? That's that would be kind of weird, you know. Yeah. So you have, so you have people like that, but then you also have uh, people like Brule uh, again. If the game itself supplies it, then yeah, obviously I would use, I would use that. Um, but there are instances where I had to, you know, listen to my own thing, but I still kind of want something hype. <laughs> because, you know, if you're in like in a tournament scene in the locals, it's too loud. I usually just like listening to what's provided, um, but try to kind of stick to the energetic theme. Yeah, so, so again, it would vary from player to player. Uh, if it's a bit too distracting, if it's too in the foreground, if it's too prominent, if it just doesn't feel right, or if it's just a song that doesn't really help the player, uh, it's more of a song that they want to hear themselves, then yeah, it can vary. But, but, but it is kind of important that the game itself provides that, um, or rather the playlist provides that if the game can't do it itself. Um, so as we get closer to uh, finding, okay, uh, full, closer to fully understanding where the game uh, needs to stand in terms of finding game songs, um, you need to also consider its mental impact, because as we said earlier, you have these songs that will embed themselves into your mind after ex years and years of exposed playtime, uh, sitting in front of the same screen, going to the same menus, uh, similar characters, uh, fighting various people in the same time, who might have a completely different experience. Um, you need to, re you, you'll eventually realize that the well-written and the well-mixed songs will definitely create memories and even moments to like really specific times in your life. Like for example, probably one off the top of my head. Um, I'll, for, I'll never, I'll always see like my local uh, and the biggest CRT on my right whenever I hear Dreamland and that is like the one CRT that was always blaring it. And that song itself is already very abrasive and very primitive as it is an N64 song. So like hearing that is probably one of the easiest things you will hear in an entire venue. Everything else in that game is way too sweepingly clean uh, <coughs> to even rival that. Um, and yeah, it can bring back people specifically to other points in their life, including um, current conductor of the RIT Gamer Symphony Orchestra, Eric Olofsson. Often, when I'm thinking about uh, like really like intense fighting game moments, I'll, I'll, I, bring, I bring myself back to um, those fights on like, uh, specifically fights on Dreamland, because I really like watching uh, games on Dreamland. And also the, the songs like in those intense moments and like things like Smash Bros. I think when I am in an intense moment in the game, I think uh, I bring myself back to those soundtracks in particular. And, as it, and it is kind of something that you can uh, keep coming back to and something that will almost bring you back to it, even outside of the game's context, which honestly is a pretty good testament as to how strong and how impactful your song track, your soundtrack has been. Um, which brings us to the results screen. So, so, what makes fighting games great? Well, it sort of helps to solidify, the songs will solidify itself as part of the overall experience. It will, uh, it will always continue to flourish as it has such a diverse culture, history, and uh, such a vast variety of experiences uh, from fighting game fans that lead to its evolution and leads to future generations enjoying it for different reasons and, re and potentially even revamping it for themselves. Um, you have these immersive songs that stay entertaining even years later, both in and out of context, uh, that keep the tone all intact. Um, and this yeah. also kind of begs the question, where's the future going to take it? Yeah, um, I just wanted to put, put my thoughts in briefly. It's just that, like, fighting games, much like any other game, is a truly immersive experience, which is only further enhanced by the implementation of music that matches the tone and the gameplay flow. So fighting game songs specifically benefit from being background music that instills the essence of a game's tone, while simultaneously hyping up the players throughout the match. And uh, as far as the future of fighting game OSTs, it's several developments like improved audio technologies, more layered compositions, more dynamically responsive mechanics like Killer Instinct we mentioned earlier, and carefully composed melodies will only strengthen that immersion even more. And uh, 
while fighting game music uses intrinsically good game music techniques, which, if done well, instills memory through specific experiences of playing against others, and we mentioned how this community of fighting game players has been developed throughout the years. And so, that kind of leads us into thinking that we'll never truly get there, but until then, we'll be continuing perfecting game. a, a fighting, fighting game OST. OST. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience and sticking with us for this over hour long panel. It's been great to be able to get cram some more content in to share with all you guys. And it's been wonderful to talk about this sort of subject at MAGFest this year. And so, at this time, we'll be taking any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions of songs or soundtracks. Anything. Yeah, and if you, even if you uh, don't want to quite have the time to talk to us here, feel free to hit us up at any of our socials. I'm basically DS Music in most places. And I'm NC Symphonies pretty much everywhere. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and start taking questions. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So a lot of classic characters are defined by specific themes that we have, like Ryu Ken, Guile, for example. Yeah. The biggest example I can think of is Yuri Yagami. He has a saxophone that all of his music is centered around saxophone music. His themes in every game are different, but every single song is centered around the saxophone playing. Right, yeah, I feel that. Because I, I know, especially like the King of Fighters 14 version, I think that's the one that really drew me into that sort of motif of establishing Yuri Yagami with like that sort of suave saxophone sound. And I, find, I do find that very interesting because it's almost uh, almost theatrical, almost like a drama in a way, where you have different motifs or different instruments being associated with characters. And so you can have, I know Noah's more of a drama person, so he knows more about the uh, like aspects of... Of saying, of staying overly, exa overly exaggerated, sort of being dramatic, but also not showing too much. And it's th that same sort of vibe of connecting music with different gameplay experiences, also I feel definitely is, works well with uh, so connecting certain motifs or certain instruments with a certain character and that experience, like even uh, not even instruments, even like I know May has had several different themes throughout the years in Guilty Gear. Yet all of her themes have been like very synth, thin, synth and metal heavy, like utilizing very airy, very high pitched, energetic sort of music to sort of complement her personality, even if the theme has been different every single year, but it's that sort of genre and that vibe that like carries through throughout the years. So even if you don't have a theme that's being remixed each game for a certain character, it's definitely, I definitely feel like it's a very strong use of, uh, it's a strong music choice to be able to utilize a genre or an instrument that's going to connect with a certain character. Yeah, it's sort of something that, uh, that is, uh, is really very in, on the composers, as long as there's like that mutual understanding of what keeps those songs important and intact uh, all the time. Yeah, so it's kind of a nice little idea. Yeah, I, I especially love the uh, sax under the, the, what is it, sax under the moon? Yeah, for, it's from 14, like, I've wanted to cover that track for a while, but I feel like I don't know if I can do that, Joe. You need a saxophone, for one. I mean, yeah, I need a saxophone. I don't play saxophone, unfortunately. But I know a couple people who do. Yeah. So maybe, maybe one day. Maybe. It takes almost all of Yori's themes, and they're all going to be great, so... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got, like, several decades to go through of that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, yes, we have a question right here. Oh, uh, maybe? But, uh, um, also, I almost feel bad in uh, saying this, but, um, uh, my friends and I on Discord will get into the odd conversation of we'll make our own sort of tier list, not the whole make the video, etc. etc. Yeah, yeah. Like soundtracks and stuff. And general consensus, at least among us, is that Mortal Kombat Pass Three is pretty much always bottom tier, specifically because of what you um, what was brought up earlier and how the songs were more like ambient and cinematic to the point where they kind of blend into the background and you don't really notice them. Damn. Right. Yeah, I mean, That's that makes harsh. sense. I remember specifically with the release of Mortal Kombat 11, how people were talking about the soundtrack doesn't feel quite up to that same sort of expectation of like the more arcadey Mortal Kombat. But then when that one trailer released, that one like release trailer, which had like a remix version of the, uh, of the, what's it called? Uh, the Mortal Kombat theme. Uh, uh, 
Ready to fight, I think it's called? What? what? Ready to fight? No, no, the, the classic Mortal Kombat theme. The one that's not even in the game, but it's from... Dun, 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 yeah, Techno Syndrome. Dun, 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 dun. When it oh. had the remix, the orchestral remix of Techno Syndrome in the trailer, even though it's not part of the game itself, but it's heavily associated with the It's game. great false advertising And people is what were it is. getting hyped, like, oh, is this track going to be in the game? If so, is it going to be one of the best Mortal Kombat soundtracks of all time? And they were just kind of disappointed when it was a more like cinematic experience. So it definitely makes sense, like you said, about... Moral combat catering toward more of the AAA, like, mainstream gaming community has sort of impacted how the fighting game community perceives it in terms of emotional connection and, like, energy connection. But, as we mentioned, it's definitely a developer choice on how they want to cater to getting more people to play their game. It's really, yeah, it's marketing. Just, it's down to the marketing and the production team's choice to, like, what stays where. It's really, yeah, it's really an artistic choice on their part to sort of... Like we said, make it more of a texture rather than a, like a its own standout product. Yeah, otherwise it'd be too distracting. Um, did we have another question in the center? Yeah, I actually have a comment and a question. Sure. Uh, first of all, I think, like, and actually it leads into my question. I think, like, especially in something like Guilty Gear, I think guys gave us a really good job of establishing instrumentation differently, even though it's the same sort of instrumentation across largely the entire soundtrack. He did a very good job of. Establishing the instrumentation for each character. I think that kind of, we kind of talked about the viewers in 2014, I think that's something that he does really well. Yeah. To lead into my question, one of the, one of the things about Strive when it came out is that its, its soundtrack was somewhat controversial, both for the presence of vocals and the themes, but also because a lot of themes kind of did things a little bit differently. So, like, example, Grandma Falls which is like this six minute like prog rock focus. Uh, it's like the least, it's like my favorite song in the game because like, I'm a big compositioner, I do a lot of composition at my own time, um, but people hate it. <laughs> it's like, it, people hate that song. And for a lot of different reasons, but I almost think it's like, when does it kind of get too far? Like from what, like, the established sound of a series. Like, they're like, that's it kind of evolved to the Yeah. And I feel like there comes a point where people kind of start failing when they realize it is the same stuff. Hmm. Right. I was actually, well, first going to your comment, I was just thinking about how we did have one example of Kai's theme from the uh, original Guilty Gear and how it has, even for like having, being a metal track, it has its own unique flavor for being like classically oriented, having a harpsichord intro. Combining that with metal along the side of it, and then in order to sort of like embody his character of being like this crusader that's off fighting for justice and whatnot, and this is just one of many like different styles and colors in the scene. But going to your question, I definitely feel like that's a uh, very good to ask because I feel like that's something that gets asked to just music artists in general. Like when people start developing their own tastes and saying that they want to make music that's not what they're sort of known for, especially more mainstream artists when they think that. What they've been writing was what's popular is not quite what they want to write anymore. And so it, uh, artists are human beings too. They have new interests, they have developing interests. They want to try out new things. And so especially Daisuke has been uh, very much uh, around the bush to trying to look at new styles and trying new bits and getting female vocalists, getting synths and whatnot. And uh, which uh, it, I definitely appre I would definitely appreciate an artist for trying something new and doing something that's more out of the comfort zone of the franchise in general, at but doing something more towards the uh, composer's intentions. Yes, yeah, at the risk of alienating its fans. Which I just feel like, as far as an art form, I feel like that's a very good choice, but like, maybe as far as a product and like maybe a marketable thing, maybe that's, yeah, that's where some of that deterrent comes in. It's really the company and the composer's decision, I feel like, to see where do you want to strike, uh, once again, striking that balance between something that is a uh, appealing to, in the side of the composer what they feel like would match the scenario whereas what they feel would be appealing to their general audience and too much really can deviate to either one side or the other so it's a very definitely a very subjective Bounce. taste sort of thing uh, it's in my opinion yeah uh, so thank you for your question and comment by the way and we had another question back there Well, especially compared to the predecessor, where the 
how mm. it would shift from character needs to stage needs to stories of it to mm. more darker in the way, especially when you get further into the game, you got like trying to have authentic God in arena in the very in the very last scene where you get in position and all fight and I get the name of the game. Yeah, it's blanking on me too, man. <laughs> um, it's been a while since I've heard the Tekken 4 soundtrack. <laughs> I mean, I'm more of like a, I'm a very casual <laughs> Tekken sort of dabbler. I do like the Tekken 7 soundtrack about that, but like, yeah, lots of Tekken's, like Tekken's also another game like Blaze Blue where a lot of it's like sort of hinging on the story for each game and how it develops over time and then how the uh, soundtracks develop over time. But uh, yeah. I feel like that's a, definitely a, Good point to bring up since, like, once again, it's all on the, the, the intent of the developer on what sort of mood they want to bring to their fighting game. And sometimes they'll reach for one crowd or maybe reach for another crowd to do something completely different based on their vision for a game. I, I'm not a game developer personally, but like, I, would I feel like it's a very, very interesting artistic choice to do something like that. <laughs> yeah? Uh, we have another sorry, question? So this is kind of like another comment. Yeah, yeah. And interesting that you brought uh, that, that you bring up Tekken in particular because I remember some of the arguments regarding Tekken Seven soundtrack about how it, it became yeah. Uh, yeah it became too close to uh, I understand this is a bit of a derogatory term uh, closer to like bro step. Oh. Uh, a lot of people, uh, well, I say a lot, but some people were definitely not fans of that. Personally, I'm a big fan. It makes me want to throw hands. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. It makes us all want a bro, dude. You know, I feel that as a fellow bro step junkie, like, <laughs> like I know I got into like the EDM set, you know, around like mid 2015s, back when like gaming dubstep mixes and whatnot were a thing, and that's I feel like that's why a lot of Tekken Seven soundtrack resonated with me in particular because those those experiences I had from like my high school years and listening to like very, very uh, deep growly EDM music. And then hearing that those sort of tastes of mine being reflected in the Tekken soundtrack, the Tekken 7 soundtrack, which really drove me to it. But there's other people who would say like, yeah, it's too, it's too weird, it's too wonky, it's too, uh, too much noise or so whatever. Yeah, they do kind of fit within the same category. Yeah. And like I mentioned earlier, like there's people in each community who are like have different tastes. Like I mentioned earlier with Susan Osteen, people meme it for being too edgy, too edgelord. And uh, but there's definitely it's definitely just different things that speak to different people. And I feel like Tekken soundtracks over the years have also worked to like diversify that sort of feel. Like whereas you have in Tekken Seven, you would always have your uh, Mishima headquarters night theme, a the helicopter theme night. You also have a bunch of other soundtracks that you can listen to. So they keep it open and varied in order to speak to different people. Yeah, that's kind of the great part about it. And that's a great part about what fighting games can do is they can, yeah. like we said, cater to a bunch of different play styles and a bunch of different uh, personalities. Yeah. And if you want to uh, keep in touch or uh, talk to any of these guys, all of them are around to chat. Or if you want to hit them up on Twitter or YouTube, you can find out any of these people if you don't know who these people are. Um, and. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we can keep these slides up for anyone who wants to uh, get some of these people. Um, this is not an open invitation to harass them, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, you can uh, check out some of these guys on Twitter, YouTube, they have their own sites. And yeah, feel free to like come up to us after the panel, because we do have only like a few minutes left, so we're going to have to get going for the next panel, but feel free to talk to us and we can give you some contact info, get it, share you, see some of our references, some of our recommendations, some whatnot. of our uh, main, some of our hot takes, your unpopular opinions. Or if you just want to throw hands on a BBCF, you know. Or Guilty Gear Strive in the arcade. Or, yeah, or, I heard they, uh, I'm so sad, I went to the arcade this morning and I was looking at the Guilty Gear Strive tourney, I was like, it's 9 a.m., it's not, it can't be full yet, it's full already. It's full. That's the fastest O2 of my life. <laughs> Damn. Don't worry, dude. But yeah, thank you again so much for coming and staying around, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your MAGFest. Take care and have a great day. Thanks again. <laughs>